Hello, welcome to a bit of game dev. So I've been creating this hobby project of mine, it's set in space as you can see, and I've come to the point where I wanted to create an influence or territory border map of some sorts. Of course, as most of us, I started searching YouTube on how to do that, but I haven't found many videos on this topic, so I thought I'd make my own. In this video I will show you two ways on how I achieved this effect. Each has its own benefits and disadvantages, as you will see later in the video. So the map behaves like this, as you can see on screen. We can move the individual stars and the map behaves accordingly. And this type of map is a vector map which means it won't lose quality no matter how close you zoom in. So first let's take a look at the components that make up this map. First we have the influence vector map script that controls how and when the map is updated. Then we have the actual map material which uses a special shader. And finally the map prefab which we instantiate, which is just a regular quad that has a map material on it. Now let's take a look at the shader which makes this map possible. First at the top we have defined properties, step and thickness. They are used to determine the thickness and the spacing between the borders. Then we have the shader values such as tag, load, z, write and blend, which enable the shader to have correct transparency. Then we have the app data struct, which samples the vertex and the normals, and the v2f struct, which samples the position and the world position of the current pixel. The world position here is important since we use it later to calculate the distance between our stars or points. Then we have my struct. This is a custom data type that we will be passing in our shader to set the properties of each point. Then we have the buffer size and id size, which just tell us the length of the structured buffer ids and the structured buffer buffer. If you're confused what structure buffer is, basically think of them as arrays in c -sharp. And finally we have the step and thickness which take just the values of our properties. The values of the other variables we will assign through a c -sharp script. So in our case the structure buffer IDs will hold the IDs that exist on the map that the points are assigned to. Let's say 0, 1 and 2. And the variable buffer is an array of all the points data, which is the point ID, color, position and the radius. Now moving on to the vertex shader, it's important to calculate the world position since we will use it later. And finally in the fragment shader is where all of the important calculations are made. But to explain it more easily, let's first simplify the fragment shader and make it render just a faded circle around each point. Just to remind you again, the buffer holds all of our point data which is assigned through a c -sharp script which we will take a look at later. Just to note for all of those who are new to shaders, float4 is the same as vector4 and float3 the same as vector3, float2 same as vector2. The distance function we use here is the same as the length function in the shader graph and the smooth step function has the same functionality as the smooth step node in the shader graph. Now in the play mode we can see that this shader renders a faded circle around each of our points. If we increase the influence radius of our points, we can see all the colors add and blend together. Now let's add to our shader another for loop which goes through the id structure buffer or array. For each of our ids we will go through every point, calculate the distance and the fade, but if the id is equal to the buffer id then we will add the color, if not we will subtract the color. Finally we will clamp the id color, then add the id color and call value and assign it to the call value. Finally when we're finished with our loop just clamp the call value and return it. Back in the editor we can see that we are getting closer to our original shader. Now only the same colors are adding together while there is a border between different types of color. I forgot to mention every ID has its own specific color. Now in our shader before returning the color let's use the step function. Back in the editor we can see something went wrong. To fix it, instead of subtracting the id color with the buffer color value, we will subtract it with the white color, which is a float4 with all the values 1. Now we can see a solid color and clearly defined borders. Now the final step is just to again apply the step function, but this time we will increase the step property value by our thickness property value and then subtract step 1 from step 2 and return it. That's it for the vector shader part.
Now let's take a look at the C-sharp side of the map. First we have our point struct, which we just used to store the point data. Then we have the point shader struct, which is a reflection of the my struct inside the shader. The point shader struct is a data type which we will be passing into our shader. Then we have a couple of variables that control how our map is created, as well as arrays for our points, colors, IDs, data list and point grid, which I will explain later. Since this is still an example, in the start function we will manually initialize our ID array, as well as our color array. Then we will create a compute buffer for our ID array, which will be assigned to the structure buffer IDs in the shader. Next we will instantiate a grid of quads, which will render the map. This is done for optimization purposes. To illustrate, we can have only one quad and assign all of our points to the material of that one quad. The problem is, this one quad will have to render always and will have to render with all of the point data, which can be really expensive. To optimize, we can instantiate multiple quads and group and assign our points to each quad. So then the PC will just not render the quads not visible, as well as each of the quads will have a smaller data set to work with. Since the ID array and the ID array size will never change, we can assign to each of our maps materials the ID size and the ID buffer. Then we initialize the point grid, which is used to separate our points according to the grid position. Now for the important function that actually updates the map. First we reset the point grid. Then for each of our points, we calculate the coordinates of the grid zone it belongs to make sure the coordinates are not out of bounds, and then finally we create the point shader struct data, where we set the position to the point's world position, as well as the radius to the point's local scale x, this is just an example, plus the influence addition, so we can control the influence radius right from this script. And finally add it to the point grid. Now, for each of the grid zones, we first clear the data list, then we combine the data from each of the neighboring zones as well as the center zone. We must do this because points outside of our zone might influence on the points inside of our zone. Finally, we create the compute buffer for our data list. The important is to set the size of the buffer, which in this case is 4 times size of float for the color, 3 times size of float for the vector, and 1 for the radius. That is 8 floats plus 1 size of int. Finally, we set the values of the shader for the buffer size and the buffer. That's it for the main function. Now to cover the rest of the script, we have our add point function, which just adds the point to the array, as well as the update, which check if the point has changed. If it has, it updates the map. And since we always update the whole map, we can reset the change for every other point that has maybe also changed. Now back in the editor, if we set our grid size to 1 times 1, we will render the whole map on only one quad. However, if we set it to 10 times 10, we will get 100 quads each rendering their own section. You can of course play with the step and thickness properties to adjust to your preference. Now, if we take a look at the FPS while rendering only one quad, we can see that it's pretty high. However, what if we increase the number of our points? We can see that our FPS drops dramatically. But now let's set our grid size to 10 by 10. We will see that our FPS is back to a normal amount. This is because of the optimization trick we did earlier with splitting the rendering to different quads. However, there is still a problem. If we, for example, build to mobile phone, even with the reduced number of stars, we can see it works catastrophically. This shader is simply too expensive to render on the mobile phone. So this is where the second type of map comes into play, the influence raster map. The main advantage of this map is it renders only once, but it renders to a texture, and thus the quality is limited by the resolution of the texture. As well, updating this map is much more expensive than updating the vector map. But the advantage is, the persistent rendering is much less expensive than rendering the vector map. So let's take a look at the components of this map. First we have the control script. Then we have a custom render texture that we use to actually render our map. I set the resolution to the highest possible, which is 8012. Then it's important to set the anti-aliasing to none, which will reduce the memory size of the texture. 
as well as set the depth stencil to none since we don't need it and it can cause incompatibility issues with mobile. Next, assign the material influence raster map render texture material to the material property. Set the initialization mode to on demand since we want to control it for our C sharp script and the update mode to on demand also because we want to control it for our C sharp script. The update zones will also assign manually for our C sharp script the same as we instantiated the quads for our vector map. Next, we can see the material the custom render texture uses. It's a bit different that instead of steps, it uses a smooth step property and a special custom render texture shader. Next, we have a simple unlit material, which uses the custom render texture as its base map. And finally, we have the map prefab, which has the influence raster map object material applied to it. Now, since all of this is a bit confusing, Let's reiterate, the custom render texture uses the influence raster map render texture material. That material uses the custom render texture shader. Now our map prefab has the influence raster map object material applied to it, which is a simple unlit material but that material uses our custom render texture as its base map. Feel free to watch this couple of times if you mess something up. <laughs> now let's go into our custom render texture shader. At the start, instead of the step, we have the smooth step 1 and the smooth step 2 properties. Now in the beginning of a shader, since this is a custom render texture shader and to make it work we must have the lines hashtag include unity custom render texture dot cg inc Prag, hashtag pragma vertex custom render texture vertex shader and hashtag pragma fragment shader frag. Those three lines must be included for the custom render texture to function. Next we have the mystruct, which is similar to the mystruct from the previous shader, just in this case we use the float tube for the position. This is because we will use a normalized vector 2 position in regards to the map. That means a position of 0, 0 will be at the bottom left of the map while the position of 1, 1 will be at the top right. Other variables are the same as the previous shader, with the exception of smooth step 1 and smooth step 2. Now in the fragment shader, we only made a couple of changes. First, instead of calculating the distance with the world position, we use the global text chord, which the shader already provides, and from our buffer, we use the normalized vector 2 position. Finally, at the bottom, we converted our step with the smooth step function, just to make the edges of our border a little bit faded, since we are limited by resolution and the more we zoom in, the more we will see the jagged edges. The control script is very similar. We again have the point struct and the point shader struct, now with the vector 2 instead of vector 3 for the position, and we have the influence render texture exposed as an editor property, which is where we will assign our custom render texture. The initialization is very similar, just in this case we instantiate only one influence map prefab and initialize the custom render texture and set the ID size and the ID's property of our shader for our custom render texture material. Now for the update function, I made it a coroutine so I can update each zone of the render texture per one frame. Since updating the whole render texture in one frame will be very expensive, this way we can split it into multiple frames. Now similar to the previous control script, we find the coordinates of the zone or the grid that the point belongs to, we calculate the normalized coordinates of the point as well as the normalized scale, and finally we create the point shader struct data and add it to the point grid. Now again similar as the previous control script, for each of the grid zones, we combine the data of our zone and each of its neighbors. Then we calculate the center and the size of the zone we want to update. And since we want to only update one zone per frame, we assign it to the zone's zero value. Then we create the buffer for our data list and set the buffer size and the buffer properties of our shader. And finally, we set the update zones of our custom render texture and then trigger the update. The final part is almost exactly the same as the previous control script, we add the point and in the update we check if the point is changed, if it has we just stop all coroutines and start a new one to update the map. Now let's see how that looks in the play mode. We can see that updating a map takes a few frames, unlike the vector map, but also that our frame rate is quite stable. 
And now if we build for mobile, we can see that the map is updated and the game is running at 60 frames per second. Hope you like this video, remember to like and subscribe, and see you next time.